small. Yeah. Okay, so um, Monday we um, we talked about nutrient <coughs> um, root zone environment. So we basically reviewed um, plant nutrition, um, macronutrients, micronutrients. Somebody asked, what's the difference, macro and macro? Uh, micro and macro, those are basically the concentrations. If it is a lot of concentration required, then it, um, it's a macro. And then micro is relatively low concentration, somewhere from 0.5 to 2 parts per million concentration. So it's very different range. Like nitrogen, usually 100 parts per million. Oh, I, should use, I shouldn't use parts per million. 100 milligram per liter concentration to 200 or so. Potassium could be 300 um, range. So it's very different concentration range. So that's why it's separating out. So today, um, we are talking about substrate. And substrate and nutrient is, is really interacting each other. Um, what kind of properties substrates have affect the available nutrient concentration in the root zone, and then also management effect, you know, what is the concentration available for the plants, and then also the system, you know, injecting system and distribution of the nutrient solution and shape of the you know, growing system itself even affects the availability of nutrients. It's quite complex. So not many people working in that, but it's very important area. And then again, you know, there are tons of information of one single element, you know, deficiency, toxicity, blah, 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 but not so much information regarding interactions, okay, because it's so complex. So if you have time, if you, if you have passion in the root zone, optimization, that's the area you want to work on. Okay, so two differences. I think this, the additional one is the redundant um, uh, uh, of the previous lecture. But um, no, actually, it's, the first one is the same one, I, I, I believe. And the additional one is the paper, scientific paper. Um, Mike Evans, um, uh, then at the Iowa State University, now at University of Arkansas, he's a media guy. He's, he's working on uh, physical and chemical properties of biological media, or, um, um, so biodegradable media, uh, not synthetic media, so like coco peat or coco coa, um, uh, rice holes, so alternative media um, instead of P. Um, so that's what he works on, and then what, that's what I wanted you to um, be familiar with. All right. Um, okay, so before talking about substrate, I want to talk about the general you know, hydroponic system. Some of you probably very familiar with this. So you can, in that case, just sit back and relax and listen to. Um, so there are multiple ways to grow, um, deliver the nutrient solution in hydroponic soil system. Um, it's very different, right, from soil system because of the properties, because of the management. So for soil-based growers, switching from soil-based production system to hydroponic substrate production system is a huge jump. So it's, I always see challenges there because not understanding substrate, not understanding the management you know, required for maintaining root zone optimum. But anyway, so I, I just want to go through okay, the typical system. There are DFD system, sometimes called pond system because you create a big pond in, inside the greenhouse. Um, uh, but DFD is a technical term, deep flow hydroponic system, deep flow technique. Is that the same as aquaponics? Aquaponics is, well, it's, it's a different terminology. Aquaponics is the combination of aquaculture and hydroponics. Deep flow usually utilizing aquaponics, so that's why you, you might 
thought, you know, you might have thought aquaponics equal DFT, but DFT itself is the system. Um, I'll show you the picture. NFT um, relative to DFT, it's much shallow nutrient film technique, so creating nutrient film so that roots are half in the water, half in the uh, air, and water is always constantly, you know, flowing so that, you know, boundary layer around the roots. There's a boundary layer around the roots, you know, you might not think about, but having a flow actually reduce the boundary layer resistance, you know, to get nutrients absorbed by diffusion. The same, exactly the same mechanism as we have uh, for the air, right? Okay, so the NFD, and then soilless culture system or aggregate-based hydroponic system. Rock wall is uh, invented in Europe, Northern Europe. I'm trying to think it was um, either Belgium or Netherlands or uh, um, what's the other one? Denmark, so the <laughs> area, uh, rock wall. Um, and then other aggregates, which we're gonna talk about. And aeroponics is um, spraying, you know, the roots on, basically sprayed, misting system. So, huh? okay, hold on a second. I need to restart this um, PowerPoint. The reason is that it doesn't show. <coughs> Whatever the reason is, sometimes does this. All right, should be okay. There you go. All right, so DFT, it's a floating system. You, you use styrofoam panel and the roots are hanging in the liquid water. So you got to somehow aerate the liquid so that oxygen you know, concentration is maintained. Um, compared to the air, what's the oxygen concentration in the air, typical? How many percent oxygen? 20, 20, 21%. In the, in the um, solution, oxygen concentration is in parts per million, so much, much lower, you know, one over million level. So around the ambient temperature, 20, 30 degrees C, the a dissolved oxygen concentration is only eight, nine, that's the range, parts per million, milligram per liter, you know, compared to the 1% is 10,000 parts per million. So 21% oxygen in the air is what? Um, 210,000 um, parts per million. So it's, you see that, you know, roots need um, oxygen and in the water, um, it may not be the best condition for oxygen uh, supply. But plants can grow if there is um, above, what is the threshold, like a, a four, three, four is probably threshold parts per million. You wanna, you don't wanna go below that. You wanna go above that when you are doing DFT. Um, uh, so roots are entirely in the liquid, oxygen must be constantly supplied, uh, so air, um, bubbling system is a typical way, um, aeration, a nutrient solution. Um, if you look at the roots, um, you can see the health. Um, if, if those are white and looking good, then, then you are fine. And then when you have oxygen depletion in a nutrient solution, then you start having black, you know, roots brown. Um, and then uh, as you can see, the um, dissolved oxygen concentration for water to hold the oxygen declines with increasing temperature. So um, if you have a, a, a very hot you know, um, temperature, and particularly if water temperature is high, then you, you, you really need to be careful to, to grow. And then you certainly need an aeration. Therefore, DFD often um, using uh, insulated, you know, uh, material to maintain the temperature relatively stable. Um, good thing of DFT is you can use um, very effectively the whole space of the greenhouse. Uh, you know, the, 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 the lettuce, for example, um, you can use for uh, leafy crop, basically, lettuce, herbs, 
and uh, the, the, the crops are growing on the panel, it's a floating, so you can you know, prepare the panel with you know, fresh transplants and then push from one side, and then by the time this panel travels the other side, you can design so that harvestable you know, stage. So plants are traveling through the greenhouse, so that is good uh, because you don't have to go inside and reach you know, to work on. And then another thing is greenhouse conditions, we talk about that in the system section, but greenhouse conditions are not necessarily completely uniform, south side and north side and sh you know, shady area and um, sunny area. But having plants traveling through the greenhouse is basically averaging out, you know, so you, you, you really um, get the very uniform growth across the greenhouse um, versus, you know, stable, stationary system, bench system, fixed, then you have always, you know, having a, some sort of variation in terms of growth speed as affected by environmental um, non-uniformity. Okay, good. One drawback maybe, um, it's, more, it's more like a, you know, the, the practical um, uh, issue. Um, in the middle of the greenhouse, you really can't see. You can't reach the middle. You, you really can't see what's going on in the middle of the production unless you somehow travel over the, <laughs> create a bridge or something. You can't really see. So in that case, engineers, you can work on that, you know, sort of diagnostic system using camera system. Uh, that'd, be, that'd be great. But I don't know if um, any grower is actually using that. You know? Well, I was going to say, so if they happen to have a pest issue, do they find out what that? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So the pest issue and then also, you know, nutrient deficiency. Um, that would be, that would be quite problematic. All right, NFT, yes, Kona. It, uh, related to, you know, I guess, pest issues and other, would it be desirable to have uh, a bunch of tanks segregated or just to have like really large tanks and have a uniform environment? It's a, it's a good question. It's a good question. Um, I think s separating into multiple tanks actually um, uh, lower the risk right, because once you have an introduction of pathogens, then big, one big tank could have disaster. Um, but managing, you know, so many tanks and duplicating the injection system and everything is probably the cost issue. So I, in my experience, every time I go to DFT-based um, production uh, company, like, like let us uh, production uh, uh, industry, they are using either one or very small number of um, ponds, um, not so many, yeah. So, okay, so the letters. Um, NFT is a very nice system because it, it can have a good height, right? Um, pond system, it's usually very low, so, you know, walking over the crop you have to bend over, um, but NFT, it's, it's, you, can be, you, you can be in a good height raised system. Um, however, the buffer capacity in terms of temperature, root zone temperature, uh, and then also um, um, uh, whatever, anything happened, electricity you know, um, is out and pump is stopped, a pump is broken, that buffer capacity is very small Therefore, um, um, it's, it's more risky, I guess, risky um, uh, system. But it works really well, again, for small growers, small um, statue crop, uh, leafy crop, and um, herbs. And some growers use this for strawberry, too. Uh, again, in terms of root zone management, um, half of the roots are actually hanging in the moist microclimate in the channel, you can see that, um, and then constant stream to reduce the boundary layer. Therefore, it is creating nice um, root zone environment, if it works and reliable. All right. Um, Ebon flow system, this is um, typical for a pot, 
you know, pot-based production system, pots and substrate. Or a leafy green, uh, but microgreens grown in um, uh, seedling trays filled with substrate. Um, sub irrigation is nice whenever you don't want to wet the plants. Okay, for example, baby leaf production, like right hand side, this is actually my greenhouse. Several years ago, we were doing tons of baby leaf production um, for nutritional study. Um, of human beings. Um, but anyway, so um, we didn't want to wet, but we need to irrigate. So the best way is ebb and flow. Um, so the, um, uh, the nutrient solution pumps in and then slowly discharged several times a day. And so um, uh, basically um, capillary action and then substrate soak up. So, so that's um, that's the system. And substrate usually, um, you know, perlite, vermiculite, all kinds of typical uh, peat moss, coconut core, granulated rock oil, um, all kinds of substrates nowadays available to grow plants. Could you do that with soil? Soil? Yeah. Soil to soil? Yeah. Like a dirt soil? Yeah. Um, if you want to, you can do it, but it's not the best substrate. Um, it works in the ground because it has a huge column, but in terms of aeration, mm -hmm. soil is very bad. So as soon as you break the column and put, pack, pack the soil in a little container, it doesn't really work well. So if you can do side-by-side um, -side studies, so obvious if you grow plants in a pot with soil, and then uh, substrate, artificial, sub, uh, artificial horticultural substrate. Plants growing in substrate is much, much faster. And yeah, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. You, you might think, you know, soil work, but soil works in ground because the big column. The physical, um, so the height, you know, so the relative to the water, um, aquifer, and then surface that, height is, is helping a lot to improve the aeration around the surface. So, and then also other capacities, you know, this is very different material, media. Okay, so, so that's why we don't use soil in a container-based production system. Even though soil is everywhere, seems like the cheapest material you can think of, but because of that, you know, not ideal properties in a small container. We don't use that. Okay, um, aeroponics. It's also uh, innovative technology, basically spraying the nutrient solution to the roots. So the roots are hanging in the air, right? Um, so this is the A-flame structure like that. This is actually the lettuce growing in the A-flame structure and then inside is the, you know, the spraying nozzles. Um, the same thing in here, it's uh, many years ago, more than 10 years ago in SEAC, um, uh, two uh, students doing uh, medicinal plant production. So the medical compounds, um, active compounds develop in the roots. So if you are growing in the soil or substrate, harvesting roots is just tedious, messy work. So instead of doing that, roots are growing in, in the air and then the, the nutrient is sprayed to the roots. So it makes sense, right? It makes sense. And it was very successful um, in, in terms of program outcomes. Uh, yeah, so that, that's the aeroponics. TJ? Oh, so that not depositing or that not accumulating the roots may might be. I yeah. I I assume some kind of stress always needed for secondary metabolites accumulation. So unstressed environment, maybe the concentration could be low. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I I I don't know. But it, they produce massive roots, which yeah. I know. Yeah, and then it's easy to harvest. You can just. Harvest the roots. Is there a reason more growers are doing this? Um, 
uh, like a, like a lettuce growers and um, well, one issue I know is a clogging of the um, nozzles, and uh, so whenever there is a risk involved, growers don't want to. Heidi. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And the problem is, is that it's like an SC, it's like the pump goes out or the power goes out and the water stops spraying and it's going to die very quickly. Yeah, five minutes and yeah. just done. Yeah. So it's kind of yeah. unreliable. Yeah, yeah. But if you have a backup power, well, you need backup power, yeah. TJ, you have? No? Yeah. So it's nice system um, may not be so full. Um, that kind of situation. All right, um, this is our system, right? In a tomato, um, rock wall or some other um, alternative substrates. Uh, rock wall um, is a um, fiberized rock, right? So you can't really decompose. Therefore, um, if you're using a lot, then it's going to be a problem. Therefore, nowadays, uh, growers are trying to be away from rock wool as much as possible, particularly large growers. Um, small growers, probably not so much, but um, uh, because rock wool is really nice material. It's, it's a very not and holding a lot of water. Consistency is there um, compared to other materials like peat or coconut core, which is a biological material uh, byproduct. Therefore, you know, different qualities between different batches, different bags, so, um, but anyway, so um, typical um, aggregate uh, used in uh, hydroponics, one of them is a rock wall. So this is a slab, and then on, that, on top of the slab, um, uh, uh, small cubes, so you start your transplant seedlings on the cube, and then the whole thing go on top of the um, slab, um, and then this, these are the drip irrigations, and then drip irrigation provide exact amount of nutrient um, according to the transpiration requirement. And then as I said earlier, uh, Monday, that you know, timing could be programmed based on the solar radiation. Enrique, you have a question? Oh, um, why did I say Rocco is not used by big growers? Because of the um, disposable issue. Um, you, you, you have to, you, you can't reuse the Rocco, right? And then the only way to get rid of them is just um, landfill, right? And it, it's not really a environmentally friendly material because it never disappear. it just stay there. So it's not, it's not, um, you can't compost rock wool, so, so that's why in, in terms of environmental concern, something like coconut core is better. Then that's why large growers are now more coconut core based rather than rock wool. It's good. It's not sustainable. Yeah, it's not sustainable. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Um, Drip irrigation, I guess I explained that. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in this type of system, this is a huge difference between hydroponic aggregate production system and soil production system. Drip <laughs> irrigation is used in the soil, actually developed as a irrigation management system for the open field soil-based production system. Israel is the leading country invented this technology. But the management is very different between two systems. The root zone in the hydroponic system is much smaller, so we have to provide nutrient much more frequently in that, in that root zone. Small amount, but more frequent. Maybe uh, somewhere between you know, 50 milliliter to 100 milliliter. Maybe the tomato is 100 milliliter per one irrigation event yet you have every 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Outside in the field, you have what? Hours of irrigation uh, with drip irrigation and once or twice a week, okay? So it's very different because of the root zone. Volume is different, buffer, you know, uh, the total water 
you can contain in the system is different. Um, um, because root zone is small and you know um, oxygen is important, so that frequent irrigation also provides not just water and nutrients but also oxygen. So that's why frequent irrigation is very important. Um, and uh, um, we always make sure to have some discharge so that 100% nutrient, nutrient solution coming in. Out of that, 70 is taken up by the plants and 30 goes out as a discharge. And that discharge is a very important for hydroponic uh, management because it's an indication of the root zone environment. Um, EC, is it, you know, salts accumulating in the root zone? Or, um, um, you know, is, is it enough amount is coming out? Um, or, you know, more than, more than the necessary amount is provided? So it's, it's, it's very important to have that discharge. Um, and compared to, again, open field, 30% is way, way too, I mean, way, very small. Outside, probably, I don't know how many times greater amount of water you need compared to what plants need. More than, um, more than double you need to apply in, in the open field production because you can't control the discharge. Um, so that means, you know, the uh, discharged um, nutrients like a phosphorus and nitrate, those are also much smaller um, in hydroponic system compared to the soil-based system. Okay, um, so it's only 30% or so coming out, but you can recycle um, and then save that discharge, right? Because the 30% discharge still containing high concentration of nitrogen and you know all that elements you are applying in a solution. So um, large growers who can afford the recirculation system um, um, have that system to sterilize, filter, and sterilize, and adjust, you know, the concentration, adding more water and adding more nutrients, and then use that again. So that 100% usage, zero waste. So, so that's a very much sophisticated system. Um, unfortunately, the technology is toward large operation like nature suite or village farms or wholesome harvest who can, you know, basically develop the sterilization system um, to run that. Small growers, I think something uh, we need to develop is the small scale recirculation system, sterilization, maybe combining available technique like small UV, you know, uh, sterilization, ozone, um, something like that would be good. But we don't have that, actually. Uh, I haven't seen small-scale recirculation, you know, um, technology. Um, how small are you referring to? How small? Like 10,000 square feet. Like, for example, you have an two-acre, two-and-a-half-acre uh, greenhouse. Two-and-a-half acres, so that means one hectare. You, I think you can afford. I think you can afford UV sterilization. Yeah, if, that, if that's the scale you're talking about. Because uh, I know Dutch growers are like that, one hectare, two hectare. So, you know, few few acres. So, but anyway, I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, so that's, uh, um, so why, why we need a sterilization? Because, you know, sp spreading disease, the same issue as pond system, so recirculating through the entire system. So once you have some pathogen, then it might spread. And then also biofilm develops notoriously, um, which I have the issue in my little recirculation um, veggie box. And that's also difficult to control. Uh, and then if anything happens, uh, nutrient imbalance could happen. You know, some um, elements could accumulate, like a, a sodium can accumulate in a, in a solution, and then eventually get to the level um, gives phytotoxicity to the plants. And then also depletion of certain, you know, it's, it's based on how much you apply and how much plants are taken up. 
So, so um, um, that could happen. So when you are doing recirculation system, growers are supposed to send the nutrient sample probably every week. You know, what's there right now? Is it actually the target? Or is anything is depleting or anything is accumulating? Um, so, all right. And uh, several sterilization disinfectants disinfection methods, um, heat treatment, UV radiation, ozone, and slow sound filtration. So those are the ones um, I know utilized commercially. TJ. Is there any good information regarding the same filters? I have one, but not much. I can, I can share that with you. So the TJ was asking any information available for uh, uh, sound filtration. Um, yeah, so there's uh, uh, actually guidelines for the surface area versus um, incoming flux of nutrient solution and uh, that kind of information. I, I think I have somewhere. I've heard they're really good. You can actually put really dirty water. Yeah, water yeah, water. yeah. And then you have to scrape the surface, sure. yeah, periodically to avoid the clogging. But I, yeah, so I, it's, yeah, so. It's a lot of maintenance and a lot of mass, but you have to deal with. But um, yeah, I, I know I know it's been used, um, although it's not not the widely used, most widely used system because of the high maintenance. I think um, I, I have seen more UV radiation um, and then ozone um, heat treatment. I have heard, but I haven't actually seen that. Um, so anyway. All right. Okay, so um, substrate, um, this is, um, uh, those pictures are in the open field. So, um, so the soil production system have a lot of challenges, right? So um, uh, pathogens, uh, soil bone disease, things like that. And this is a California strawberry production site. And they are testing substrate production in open field. So they create um, basically a trough in the soil bed and put the um, uh, uh, permeable plastic material like a weed, weed barrier mat um, and then put the substrate, it's, it's, it's really horticultural substrate, and then grow them in the field so that you know, the substrate is clean, um, therefore they don't need fumigation. Um, to kill the bacteria and um, pathogens, other pathogens and nematodes. Um, the reason why they are testing is because of the lack of control tactics, um, specifically methyl bromide, which is a chemical widely available to fumigate the soil. But now, because of the ozone layer, um, uh, International Treaty decided, you know, we are not going to use it anymore. So they, they lost that most effective fumigant and the alternative technologies may not be so reliable. Therefore, they wanted to test much different way to grow strawberry plant in the, in the soil and actually soilless. But one of the challenges of growers I have heard is number one is cost because so much substrate, right? You can thousands of acres of production substrate. It's a lot of substrate, and it's, it's cost. Secondly, they have not get, uh, they haven't understood the necessary root, mana root zone management, meticulous management. We, we, you know, like me and this group started with hydroponics, and, you know, it's, it's, it's so, standard, you know, irrigating so frequently and managing EC and pH and, you know, checking volume and coming out and everything. But for open field growers, it's it's totally different world. So they didn't really understand the need. Therefore, they flood too much, you know, saturate the media too much or dry out. And so it was not really successful. So anyway, it's just the example of challenge um, to introduce a system into totally different um, environment. But hopefully, you know, if you put the envelope, right, it's going to be controlled environment, high tonal substrate production system. So one step away, 
a little bit more sustainable. Um, anyway, so I talked about that. Um, so let's talk about characteristics of substrate. Um, so there are three different properties we usually pay attention. One is uh, chemical properties. The second one is physical properties. And uh, third one is biological properties. Um, you know, sometimes um, uh, it's not completely sterilized, but it, sometimes it works really well to prevent um, pathogen um, to develop and build up. So biological properties are also important. Um, in terms of uh, chemical properties, cation exchange capacity, which I talked a little bit on Monday, um, you know, um, adsorbing um, the cations um, over the surface um, of the substrate, and pH and porosity, bulk density, water holding capacity. I'm talk talking about those in a minute. So cation exchange capacity, some of the substrates are very high in cation exchange capacity, and some of them are very low. And hydroponics, we want to use low cation exchange capacity so that you have a total control over the, the nutrient um, concentration. If you are using high cation exchange capacity substrate, that means the um, surface of the substrate solid material, like this one, um, charged negatively, so the positively charged cations basically, you know, got stuck on, on the surface. And then it creates a buffer capacity, so it works really well, like in the soil, so that you don't have to add all the nutrients, you know, in the, in the, in the fertilizers, because the available ones are sitting in the soil. It's a capacity. So um, high cation exchange capacity is ample nutrient reserves, so it's good in the soil system. But in the substrate-based hydroponics, root, system, root zone is small anyway, um, we want to apply the, the complete uh, uh, formula of uh, fertilizer. In that case, um, cation exchange capacity is preferred to be very low. Um, so, so that's the cation exchange capacity, right? Um, porosity is oxygen-related parameter, so how much air in the space. So if you create a pie chart, you know, um, um, solid and water or liquid and air, you know, so the distribution depending on the substrate, right? And the porosity is either water plus air or air only. And if you, if you say the percentage of air volume relative to the total, we call air porosity. If you say just porosity, that means, um, or total porosity, that means water and air occupying that volume of substrate. Okay? All right. So, and then uh, oxygen availability is usually higher when porosity or air porosity is higher. Makes sense, right? Air, more air in the root zone, therefore more oxygen. Okay. Bulk density is um, mass divided by volume density, okay? And then this is usually pretty well correlated with porosity. High porosity meaning less bulk density, you know, smaller bulk density, high porosity. Um, porosity, I think, is difficult to measure, if I remember. Um, are you familiar with how to measure porosity, Justine? It's not that difficult? Okay. I, I thought bulk density is much easier to measure, therefore sort of use bulk density as an alternative parameter. But anyway, she, she's the expert on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So anyway, so um, um, if you know bulk density, it's, it, you can actually, um, you know, either high or low, you can actually tell high or low in terms of porosity. Okay, um, and this one is again, so um, this particular experiment um, is showing the relationship between bulk density and growth rate of the roots. Um, and then you can see very much um, uh, linear relationship. Higher the bulk density, the root growth is low because uh, porosity is low, right? 
higher bulk density porosity is low, um, oxygen availability is low, therefore the root, root growth is restricted. Okay, um, water holding capacity, amount of water that substrate can hold, um, literally means that. Um, and uh, usually expressed by volume, percent volume, you know, how much water relative to the volume of the substrate. Um, Rocco has really high um, water holding capacity. Um, another parameters, physical parameters, um, uh, important to understand if you are um, a controlled environment um, scientist or engineer, the color of the substrate does affect um, temperature. So it's very important reflectance and absorption of the substrate or container is, is very important. And then size and height, you know, dimension of the, of the um, substrate holding part or container is very important. If it is taller, it drains much better because of the gravitational potential you know, a top surface and lower surface. If it is higher, then you, you get much better drainage. Uh, we talk about that put, uh, water potential next week. But anyway, so the size and height geometry of those um, affects a lot. Um, so basically, plant has a factors, right, um, affecting root zone and substrate, and then also the shape, the system itself. So that's a very much complex system. All right, so this is our data. We were growing, um, what was the crop? Oh, safflowers. Um, it's a field crop, but we wanted to test in a greenhouse, and we created three different temperature conditions to test. Um, and uh, um, it was during midsummer and high radiation conditions. So we tested the root zone temperature um, uh, under shaded condition and non-shaded condition, uh, yes and no, regarding shading. And then also we added one more factor because we noticed that root zone temperature of that plant is very high. So we put aluminum foil, you know, covering up the surface of this black polyplastics, and then see how much, you know, temperature reduced by doing so. So this is just a demonstration. So you can see that um, um, air temperature 25, if I don't have any reflective material covering the, the plastic uh, part, then I got 34 degrees um, under the uh, non-shaded environment. And then um, just by putting aluminum um, I, I got uh, 30 degrees, so the four degrees lower. Sometimes I got six or seven degrees lower temperature by just creating the, um, you know, material to reflect the radiation hitting the uh, substrate. So it is very important to understand temperature because root zone temperature affect the respiration of the roots and oxygen availability in the nutrient solution. Let me cough. Sorry. All right. Okay. So this one is a diurnal, diurnal um, um, change of the root zone temperature. One good thing um, I always think about the soil system is a huge buffer capacity. Temperature is so stable. This is just 10 centimeter below the surface in bone, you know, the mid-summer Tucson um, under the sun, okay? It's not in the gr greenhouse. And it's, outside temperature is probably 40, 42, 43 degrees C, but soil temperature never go beyond 35 because of the buffer capacity. Um, if you're growing plants in a pot, look at that. Those are all, everything else is pot you know, the uh, substrate in the pot. Uh, actually, the same experiment in the previous slide. Um, huge oscillation in terms of temperature, sometimes beyond 45 degree, 47. And then that temperature is also affected by the size of the pot. So the big pot has, of course, has um, more buffering capacity. Therefore, 
um, reduce the um, up and down oscillation. So those are the big parts, black dots, and then the, the blue ones are um, small parts, one gallon part. And then um, small parts with aluminum foil, um, which is pink line, um, reduce the temperature too. So something like that when you, are, for example, working on research and then you got to grow field crops in maybe in a greenhouse or outside using a pot system, you really need to pay attention the root zone environment totally different from that it's supposed to in in-ground system. So you, you have to be careful to interpret cottony you have question. Why, why we didn't? Um, maybe we didn't think about <laughs> the, you know, the design carefully. Yeah, that would be, that'd be good. Yeah, probably two gallon and further down, right? Further down the temperature or the, you know, mi mitigate the oscillation. Good point. All right. So, yeah, so those things, you know, um, not just air, air temperature, but root zone temperature is very important. Um, Okay, so the typical horticulture plant production uh, substrate um, going through um, peat moss. Um, actually, got some samples, so you're gonna, um, if you haven't looked at um, peat moss, um, it's very nice, um, but um, this is a, a sphagnum moss, it's a typical Canadian or European. Uh, resource. Um, it's coming from bog, um, so it's resource, limited resource, natural resource, so we are not supposed to use too much. Although North American supply is uh, supposed to have plenty according to the industry, but I'm not sure. Um, so um, industry is, is going to away from the use of peat. Peat came in as a great material, but um, right, right now we are more into alternative material, which is uh, coconut core. Um, peat is um, very acidic, um, so you can't really use straight peat, but um, um, as a, as a um, water holding capacity and porosity, it's a really nice material. Uh, oop, peat moss. Coconut core, so that's right. So that's coconut core. I'm circulating, and uh, um, but coconut core compared to peat, um, it has a huge um, salts uh, in it because it uh, it's basically from the coconut byproduct and it's a fruit. So potassium is used for sugar translocation, and therefore it tends to accumulate in the fruit. Um, so uh, you you got to wash the coconut core when you when you use coconut core. Uh, in the horticultural substrate. Um, and then other characteristics here, low porosity, um, it's, it's uh, um, lower cation exchange capacity compared to peat. Um, but as biological material, same for peat, but um, depending on the source, where it is coming from, the capa uh, characteristics you know, um, chemical and physical characteristics vary uh, a lot. So you, 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 consistency is, is the challenge in, in terms of core. Yes? Uh, I know from a lot of the manufacturers of core, you can buy different blends. Great, like yeah. Fiber. yeah. A lot of people argue that, you know, more pith is better or more fiber is better. I was wondering if you had an opinion on that, on the ratio. Depending, depending on the crop. Yeah, so the, so the different uh, grays, the, the, f the fiber content or the um, coarse versus fine particles, huge range of materials available. So you got to choose by testing. And then I wish, I, I wish they have a good sort of um, index or value, like a porosity, um, then we can choose in the range but I never had or never seen, I may be wrong, you know, the substrate company actually showing that right. together with the material. So I don't know why. Uh, maybe there is some challenge there, but 
I wish to have the, all the capacity in the label, you know, like uh, the characteristic, chemical characteristics and everything written that would be great so that we can consistently choose the similar material every time we, we purchase. But yeah, so there are a huge range in terms of um, characteristics in coconut core. Um, and peat, right? And vermiculite, um, that's, I, uh, you don't use straight vermiculite either, but it's nice amendment, I guess, um, uh, particularly when you are using peat, because vermiculite is very strong basic, uh, so acidic and basic and then neutralized. So peat and vermiculite mix is it's pretty common in Nikkei. Over the, over the seed. Yeah. yeah, we use that way too. We, yeah, so we use that way. Um, so right now, vermiculite often used for covering the seeds so that um, creating more moist condition and then also blocking light because some seeds germinate really well under dark rather than under direct light. So yeah, we use that too. It's very useful material. Um, it, it, it has a good water holding capacity Jessica. So um, peat moss is very acidic and then vermiculite is basic? That's right. Okay. Yeah. But there's a big caveat there. Um, depending on the countries, um, it, they neutralize vermiculite. So it's not always. Because I, I, I'm from Tokyo. I'm, I grew up in Japan and they always neutralize vermiculite. So I, I use vermiculite straight. You, you have no problem. And I came here didn't know at all vermiculite <laughs> is supposed to be acid, I mean, basic. So I thought we can grow <laughs> no problem, and it was actually totally different pH. So depending on the country, how they distribute the materials, it's, it's different. So it's quite kind of interesting Will experience. It stay on the bag? Pardon? Will it stay on the bag? Um, I didn't notice, because that was the sort of standard expectation. So I was using that in a tissue culture, vermiculite, and 100% vermiculite. And then every time I came to international conference and they say, we use 100% vermiculite and then this, this works really well. And then US researchers particularly, really? You grow plants in 100% vermiculite? And it's, yeah, we do. And then I had no idea why, why they were questioning, you know, we are doing crazy thing until I actually started working here and then testing and oh that's so I yeah it's interesting anyway multicultural experience <laughs> anyway so yeah so that you need to pay attention when you are going to totally different countries why I think I think vermiculite is probably seven point seven point five or eight. I I'm not hundred percent sure, but that so you, you want to create six point zero ish when you do substrate culture. It's not completely neutralized, so that weak acidic. So that five point five to six point five is the target in the substrate production. That's the, you know the the best condition for roots to function, so that's the target. So it's not completely neutralized. I'm not familiar with the hydroponics. Yeah. But would you, if you use it, would you probably help in pollution? Yeah. So, okay. We use yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So okay. So that's vermiculite, right? Um, Pallite, that's also quite useful material to increase the porosity. Um, we, um, we had a coconut core substrate um, and uh, um, that was uh, too fibrous so we had to add pallite to increase the porosity for growing strawberry for example. Um, mixing those uh, in is, is good. You can grow straight pallite because it's, it's okay uh, pH range. Um, however, some plants are sensitive, um, so you, you so you you might want to um, add uh, uh, something to it uh, to um, um, either reduce the pH or 
um, fluoride issue, which I have heard of that. Okay, um, sand. Um, not many people use sand for growing plants because it doesn't have uh, good water holding capacity unless you want to, but very inert. So if you look at the old literature of hydroponics, sand is a typical substrate used um, in the old uh, hydroponic study because it doesn't affect the nutrient profile. Zero cation exchange capacity. So, um, oops, sand. In rock wall. Rock wall is, is um, fiberized rock, molten rock, um, volcanic rock, and uh, um, cation exchange capacity is very low, therefore it, it has, it, it, you, can, you can actually um, have a good control, right? If you want to change nutrient from one solution to Another, you can instantly change without worrying about that buffer capacity. That's nice. Um, very high water holding capacity and moderate air porosity um, to grow plants. Um, so I like rock wool, but it's expensive, relatively expensive. That's another, maybe another reason as well. So um, multiple tables I have um, just to show the difference in terms of substrate. Um, when you said that people use uh, cocoa Yeah. But how, how do they plant the seed? Do they just put it inside the oh. seed or back? Or, or how do they do it? Um, there's a coconut core cubes, okay. yeah, um, to start, start with. Um, so it's not directly seeding the coconut core okay. bag. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. But um, I have seen many growers still using cubes, roku cubes, and then put the cubes on the coconut core bag. Yeah, that's how we do it here. Yeah, because I, I think, this is my guess, but I think the performance of that coconut core cubes not as great as roku in terms of seedling production. And, you know, that change. Uh, the, the change in growth in seedling is affecting a lot. So growers don't want to sacrifice by using um, underperforming substrate. But that, that's still complicated because uh, using rock wool, you can, you can say that your cell is just enhanced. Oh, 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 yeah, you can't use rock wool for organic certification. No, that's so right. So you need to move away from rock wool if you want to do organic. That's right. Yeah. So you have to find uh, alternative substrate that works for your production system. Okay, so this table um, is uh, physical properties of um, uh, soil. As Oh, Ken, yes. Uh, going back to the rock wool slide. Yes. Uh, It is, but I think the residual material of the processing rock wool at the beginning uh, it tends to create high pH. So you are supposed to wash with acid water or something like that. It's a recommendation. We usually just rinse it, um, if I remember. Yeah, and then initial uh, few weeks, usually high pH but it didn't cause any iron, iron deficiency, so we just do it as it is. Maybe not the ideal, but yeah, it tends to, whatever the residual material cause the pH high, but it's, it, it stabilized at the end, yeah. Good question. All right, so this is um, showing the, uh, a type of soil, sandy loam, um, uh, peat moss, substrate, pearlite, pearlite, different um, uh, uh, sides of the particle sand and the vermiculite. So you see that bulk density um, is pretty different. So you can see the soil, sandy loam is high uh, bulk density. That means low air porosity, um, very low air porosity um, compared to other substrate. 
and this is a water holding capacity. The highest one uh, in this um, comparison is the peat moss, 100% uh, peat moss. And then followed by vermiculite and peat and pyrite uh, mix. Um, this one is a cation exchange capacity, CEC value. Uh, by the way, how many of you are familiar with milli equivalent unit? You okay? So it's like a more but divided by valence. So that if it is two plus ion, then you have to divide by two, right? So um, because it's a, a electric charge related, so typically milli equivalent or equivalent is used. You can say micro equivalent if you want to. So that M is actually milli, milli um, prefix of the unit. Okay, so it shows very high. Um, cation exchange capacity for vermiculite. Uh, sand is super low, pyrite is low, coconut core is intermediate. So you see that uh, the value. Okay. So again, CEC capacity is showing the buffering capacity to capture all the cations, right? Uh, adsorption. Um, okay. And this one is a Mike Evans, um, Arkansas um, data. Uh, it, it shows the difference in terms of uh, chemical characteristics, no, uh, yeah, chemical and physical characteristics of the coconut core uh, from different sources, Philippines and um, two locations in the Philippines, um, and then two and three batches for each locations. And then you can see that a uh, huge difference uh, in terms of water holding capacity um, and cation exchange capacity and others. Because again, this is a challenge of biological material. You really can't get the consistency. Okay. Um, this is my strawberry research. Um, strawberry is very sensitive to root zone environment. Um, and then this is showing um, substrate does affect a lot the, the plant performance. We did in the pot um, because we didn't have, you know, the, uh, um, the capacity in the greenhouse. So we did a small study testing a bunch of different substrates. But two varieties, Camino Real and Arvion. So up to here, we tested percent um, pyrite mixed into coconut core. We, we use fibrous coconut core, so low air porosity, so adding um, pyrite is increasing air porosity, um, uh, decreasing bulk density. Um, and then you can see that 100% cocoa plants are miserable, right? And then 50% um, cocoa, 50% uh, pyrite, they are happy, happy. And rock wool worked really well because it has a good, you know, moderate porosity. Um, but Mikirite pyrite um, plants are not happy at all. Okay, because vermiculite probably pH issue, um, uh, uh, too acidic, um, uh, in, no, the other way, or basic uh, in this case. All right, so it's very sensitive. So I don't know how many of you actually remember um, um, tomato research. This is Mara Jensen's, Dr. Jensen's data showing that basically, you know, they don't care. Uh, Root, root system, substrate, anything basically works really well. Um, so um, they, I don't know how many years ago, may, many years ago they tested different substrate, coconut core, pyrite, uh, peat light is basically peat moss and mixed with either vermiculite or pyrite or something, you know, to, to, to change the properties. And then um, coconut core and pyrite and rock wool, and then basically, there is no statistical comparison, but what he was saying that there is no um, difference in yield, and there is no difference in the fruit size. So as long as root system uh, or irrigation is managed well, his point was substrate didn't affect. So it's very different from what I got for the strawberry um, compared to what he got for, for the tomato system. Right? So what is causing that? Yeah, depending on the crop. So there is a research showing the crop difference in terms of oxygen requirement. So this one is uh, um, different temperatures and oxygen uptake rate of the roots 
um, par same amount of roots. Um, and then strawberry is much higher oxygen requirement compared to tomato. So they want to have more air in the root zone. So there are a lot of sensitive plants and insensitive plants in terms of root zone oxygen. Okay. Um, this one is a uh, woody plants. Woody plants, uh, this is mosquito, mosquito um, uh, seed rings. Woody plants typically sensitive. You know, probably the same thing. The oxygen requirement is high. Therefore, they respond to the substrate more vigorously than like tomato or cucumber or lettuce. Um, this is, left hand side is, uh, I think it's a pallite, straight pallite, and right hand side is a uh, um, uh, commercial substrate, pallite, vermiculite, and peat mix. And then you see that the same age of seed rings, um, you see that uh, small plants, left hand side, much, much better growth in right hand side. Woody plants, again, um, do this. Okay, so the factors for consideration, plant species as I showed, oxygen requirement, and response to EC and porosity, um, response to root zone res uh, uh, restriction, you know, the space, um, transpiration demand, and growing stage would um, also affect which, you know, stage it is, seed rings or much larger mature stage. And uh, irrigation and nutrient delivery system, uh, frequency, container size, as I said, those are also affecting root zone. Um, and substrate, if used, kind of substrate source and mixing ratio. So those are all um, involved as important factors affecting root growth, and root growth is affecting above, you know, plant growth. All right. So the Strawberry and tomato comparison, just to give more um, feed for thought, how different they are. So I just put the, uh, whatever the um, available information um, in addition to the oxygen requirement. So tomato is usually big, right? The mature crop, LAI leaf area index is much, much greater than, than um, strawberry. So the um, LAI is usually four to six tomato. Strawberry is one to two, yet the volume, root zone volume per plant is about the same, two liter or so for tomato and uh, strawberry. So that means, you know, the transpiration demand for tomato is much bigger and relative size of the root zone to the transpiration demand is much smaller in uh, tomato compared to strawberry. And maybe that's one reason strawberries are so sensitive to the root zone, or root zone affects a lot to the strawberry plant growth. Yet tomato, because of the you know, huge transpiration demand, that means more nutrient solution coming in. So the total nutrient uh, solution per day, per plant, in tomato is about two to four liter, depending on the season, versus tomato, uh, versus, uh, strawberry is only 300 milliliter or so, so it's one tenth. So that situation would also affect the sensitivity of the plants to the root zone, and it's it's all related, all related. So you can't really generalize. You know, uh, substrate doesn't affect, or substrate does affect. It's it's all about the system. You know, what kind of system? and um, amount of nutrient solution going into the system, is it huge or is it small? Um, that would affect very much. So um, uh, we, we, we started here in the program, you know, growing tomato and cucumber, relatively tall crop, um, and then um, root zone pH is pretty um, easily controlled in tomato system by controlling incoming nutrient solution. As long as nutrient solution is adjusted pH at six, around six, plants are okay. Um, strawberry case, because amount of nutrient solution to apply uh, relative to the root zone volume is so small, only 300 milliliter going in to the two liter per plant root zone, um, therefore, uh, substrate pH affects a lot more than 
the solution pH. So we had to adjust the substrate pH in the range because solution pH cannot, you know, overcome. So those things really um, um, very important to, to find the best conditions for the plants. All right, that's it. Oh, if anyone want to go and see my strawberry greenhouse, stay. We go and see strawberry greenhouse after this. If you need to go, go.